Um, so I'm uh, Si Hong Yuan. I'm a fifth year graduate student at Harvard. And uh, for the next 45 minutes, uh, Johannes, Jeremy, and I are going to lead the discussion on uh, galaxy assembly bias and application of galaxy halo connection in cosmological studies. Uh, next slide, please. So let me just start off by asking the question, what is assembly bias? Like, how do we define assembly bias? So I think when we talk about uh, this defect, we're mostly talking about two separate phenomena. So the first is halo assembly bias, the, which is the effect that the clustering of halos at fixed mass has a dependence on properties other than halo mass itself. And then the secondary effect is uh, galaxy assembly bias, which is the fact that at fixed halo mass, the uh, galaxy properties or number of galaxies within halos may depend on secondary halo properties that themselves show a halo assembly by signature. So the easy way to visualize this is that in the uh, popular HOD framework, this shows up as a secondary dependence in HOD other than halo mass. So the number of galaxies per halo uh, might depend on things like, um, you know, halo spin concentration or other things. Uh, I just want to point out that there is still some, a little bit of murkiness in the field as to what is exactly galaxy assembly bias. So still in some works, you'll see that people more generically define galaxy assembly bias as how galaxy clustering depend on um, secondary halo properties. So that would be kind of a combination of uh, the halo assembly bias and the kind of HOD effects that we're seeing that, that we define here. All right, next slide. So why do we care about assembly bias? So I think that um, understanding galaxy assembly bias will help us understand the processes in galaxy formation. And uh, in terms of modeling, ignoring assembly bias can yield significant errors in uh, galaxy halo connection constraints. And it, can, it could also bias your cosmology, cosmology inferences. So on the right-hand side, I'm showing you a couple of plots from uh, Zenner et al.'s uh, 2014 paper where they did a test to show um, how ignoring galaxy assembly bias can bias your uh, HOD inferences. So the blue circles are the are showing the kind of underlying truth HODs in a um, set of mock galaxy sample. Uh, on the right, the uh, mocks do not contain any assembly bias, but on the left, the mocks do attain do uh, contain some assembly bias. And what they did is they tried to fit these, uh, these mocks using a standard five-parameter HOD that does not have any assembly bias. So unsurprisingly, on the right, when you fit the no assembly bias model to the no assembly data, no assembly bias data, the, uh, you recover pretty well the underlying truth HOD as shown by the, uh, black, the black curve. So the black curve is the best fit HOD. But on the left, when the data does have some assembly bias, then the model, then the fit fails pretty bad. So you can see that the uh, recovered uh, best fit HOD has this like strong knee-like feature at low halo mass. So what that is doing is that the fit is trying to put as many galaxies as possible into higher mass halos to compensate for the lack of assembly bias. Uh, next slide. So um, for the next couple of minutes, I want to focus on a question of identifying the secondary halo property that best captures galaxy assembly bias. Um, so recent works uh, have shown that the most informative halo property does not is not uh, halo concentration. It is actually the local environment of the halos. So I'm going to highlight two papers recently. The first by Xiaoju, um, from, uh, uh, where they use semi-analog models to uh, explore these effects, and then uh, also Boriana Hajiska's paper from last year where she used uh, hydrosims to do similar work. So um, Xiaoju already showed this plot uh, earlier, but I'm just going to quickly go over it again. Um, so what, it, what, you're, what you're looking at is the uh, full, the, uh, the breakdown of uh, the galaxy assembly bias effects uh, in terms of different uh, secondary halo properties. So the black curve on top is showing the kind of the full amplitude of galaxy assembly bias effects I just shown the uh, galaxy correlation function divided by the shuffle galaxy correlation function. So when you shuffle the, the galaxy contents of the halos within each mass spin, you remove the effects of galaxy assembly bias. So this is showing kind of how much is galaxy assembly bias boosting the clustering of galaxies. So you can see that at small scales, there are no effects, but at intermediate scales, 
the Galaxy Assembly bias is kind of boosting the cost rate by 17 to 18%. And then the different color curves are showing how much of that effect is captured by each individual secondary parameter. And you see that, you know, the, uh, the halo age, halo concentration, angular momentum, they only kind of cover, recover 20 to 30% of that. Uh, but if you look at the bottom panel where they use the local density um, as the secondary parameter in HOD, not sorry in HOD, but if, if you look at those as the secondary parameter, um, then it kind of recovers the uh, full amplitude of the galaxy assembly effect. So specifically, the delta 1.25, which is uh, local density smooth over a 1.25 megaparsec Gaussian filter, uh, does a really excellent job of recovering the uh, assembly bias signature. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, so this is a couple of plots taken from Boreana's paper last year where she used uh, the illustrious TMG simulation to do similar work. So on the top left panel, uh, she's showing the assembly bias signature, again, the ratio of uh, galaxy clustering uh, divided by the galaxy clustering divided by the shuffled uh, galaxy clustering. And then she tried to use different uh, halo properties as the secondary parameters in, their, in her HOD to reproduce this kind of clustering signature. And then she found that the local environment, specifically defined it as a five megaparsec top hat um, around each halo, does a pretty good job at recovering the assembly bias signature. And if you look at the bottom two panels, she's showing that if you use halo concentration or formation epoch, it doesn't do nearly as good a job at recovering the, uh, uh, the, the, the shape of the assembly bias signature. So next slide. Um, so hopefully that serves to show that um, maybe halo concentration is not the correct or the, be the best uh, secondary property to use in your HOD if you want to capture galaxy assembly bias effects. And maybe we should start thinking about um, Halo environments more seriously as the uh, as the secondary dependence. So uh, on this slide, I want to discuss how do we actually extend your standard HODs to include these secondary properties. So I think in the um, in the last couple of years, there have been mostly two approaches. The first approach is the galaxy swapping approach. So this is exemplified in a decorated HOD. Uh, so what you do is a fixed halo mass. You basically move galaxies between halos of different, say, environments uh, density. Um, the second approach is to directly inject secondary dependence into the HOD parameters themselves. So again, these are the um, pro uh, proposed HODs from uh, Xiaoju's paper, where uh, they basically set the HOD parameter and min and one as direct, um, as functions of the uh, delta parameters. So uh, Wash and Tinker 2019 did a very similar thing where I think they set uh, min as a function of uh, the environment. And in my paper back in 2018, we tried to uh, directly modify the halo mass itself as a function of uh, the secondary parameter, which achieves a very similar effect as modifying the mass parameters in HOD. Uh, next slide, please. So um, finally, I want to just uh, showcase some recent results we had uh, trying to fit the um, full shape uh, redshift space two-prong correlation function from BOSS CMS data with an extended HOD that includes the environment-based assembly bias effect. So the bottom panel is showing you an example of the, uh, the, the, uh, the full redshift space two-prong correlation function. And uh, the, so what we did is we tried to fit this redshift space two-prong correlation function with an HOD, a very extended HOD that incorporates um, various physically motivated effects such as uh, velocity biases and satellite profile uh, variations and also environment-based assembly bias. So the right-hand panel is showing you the summary of the uh, best, the environment assembly bias best fits across all of our, uh, all, all, across all the fits that we've done. So the AE parameter at the bottom is the uh, parameter that we use to characterize the strength of environment assembly bias. So what, 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 we, what we found is that there is a, there is a consistent three to five sigma positive um, detection of, uh, of, of, of environment assembly bias uh, across our fits. So if you look, at, look through the fits, we've 
try to just directly fit the SRP pi, which is the two-point correlation function. And then we try different random number Cs. We try using different set of boxes. We try different thinning. And we also try changing the shape of the HOD. Uh, we try different data compression uh, using fitting WP plus multiple. Uh, and then also fitting size mu. Um, also, the uh, the red dots are showing our fits using a different set of simulations. So these are the Atlas Summit simulations, which you know uh, use has different mass resolutions and are done at a slightly different cosmology. And we still recover this uh, positive uh, res uh, positive AE best fit. Uh, we also try to change the cosmology a little bit, walking two percent in sigma A, walking two percent in omega M. Uh, that doesn't seem to change the change our results. So I think the takeaway point here is that um, when you build your HOD models to and you want to capture some assembly bias effects, maybe you know halo concentration is not necessarily the best secondary parameter to use, uh, but rather uh, we should look at halo environments uh, as a more efficient way to capture galaxy assembly bias. Um, yeah, and on that note, I'll hand it over to Johannes to talk about the um, observational evidence for galaxy assembly bias. Uh, thanks. Um, so we've seen that there has been tremendous progress in characterizing galaxy assembly bias in theoretical models of galaxy formation. We had from Sirhan, but also Sergio Contreras and uh, Xiaoju Xu. But of course, um, we now want to know uh, how does galaxy assembly bias look in the real universe? And that's interesting uh, enough itself for uh, galaxy formation, but it is also very relevant for cosmology. Because as we've seen, um, galaxy assembly bias can affect uh, clustering predictions at a fixed HOD at the level of 10% or higher. And so this is uh, much larger than even current uh, statistical uncertainties that we have in cosmological measurements. And so thereby, galaxy assembly bias is a potential roadblock to achieving precision cosmology. And so I want to use this time to just quickly review what have we learned about the presence of galaxy assembly bias uh, in the real universe uh, over the past three years. So when we had uh, the, the conference in 2017, uh, there were two very direct pieces of evidence that one could cite for the presence of assembly bias. Uh, on the one hand, there was this very intriguing result from the Red Matter clusters uh, presented by Seward Moore and uh, Miyatake. And they showed that you can have two different uh, samples of clusters um, selected by uh, the radius distribution of the members um, that have very similar halo masses, uh, but very different uh, large scale clustering properties. Uh, that's what's shown in this plot here. And so this would be a very direct evidence for assembly bias, basically by definition, because you have two samples of halos with the same halo mass and different clustering amplitudes. Uh, similarly, there was also this two halo galactic conformity signal, uh, in which was claimed that uh, nearby central galaxies uh, can have correlated properties, like for example, star formation rates. And so it was pointed out later that um, such a finding can be very naturally explained uh, in a universe where we do have galaxy assembly bias. Now, during the conference and also over the past three years, it became more and more clear uh, that both of these results uh, can be mostly, if not entirely, be explained uh, by systematic errors, either in the way we identify groups of cluster of galaxies or we identify isolated central galaxies. And so the, the kind of painful lesson that we learned is that um, these direct searches for galaxy assembly bias, but while being seemingly very convincing, are also very prone uh, to systematic errors. And so some people also turned to more indirect searches uh, for galaxy assembly bias. Um, by that, I mean that you just take a single sample of galaxies and you look at their clustering or uh, lensing amplitudes and you fit this with a model with a variable level of galaxy assembly bias and just ask, what does the data uh, favor? Um, so one such study was uh, performed by Andrew Zentner and collaborators uh, where we looked at the clustering properties of galaxies in SDSS. And so we fitted this with this Decker HOD uh, model that uh, uh, Suhan men mentioned. And this has this uh, parameter ASEN, which controls the amount of galaxy assembly bias. And if that ASEN parameter is zero, you have no galaxy assembly bias and 
any other value between minus one and one uh, would correspond to assembly bias. And so sure enough, when we do this exercise, we do find uh, certain samples of SS galaxies where the data seems to tell us that this ASN parameter is very different from zero. That's what you can see here. Now, normally this is a very strong section of galaxy assembly bias. Uh, the question is, is this now really convincing evidence for it? Um, I would say there are still a lot of questions that we need to answer. So for example, uh, something that we have to really show is that no other uh, additional model freedom we could give it uh, could not equally well explain the data. And so just one example, uh, we had a, um, a theoretical study recently where we uh, made forecasts for clustering constraints uh, from the BOSS uh, galaxy survey. So this is a purely theoretical study. So we're able to just uh, create mock data sets where we know what the answer is. And so in this case, we created clustering predictions uh, for a certain cosmology characterized by F sigma eight being around 0.47. And where we have like moderate levels of galaxy assembly bias, uh, 0.5. So it's the red star here. And so if we take this mock data set and we analyze it with uh, different simulations with different cosmologies. And so for example, if we do assume the right cosmology, the one that was put into the mocks, and then we're able to get F sigma eight, uh, sorry, ASN constraints that are basically unbiased, we're able to recover the input parameter. If on the other hand, we assume an F sigma eight that is too low, we can infer very strong galaxy assembly bias, but it's not actually there. Uh, similarly, if F sigma eight is too high, we get uh, either no assembly bias or even the reverse galaxy assembly bias. So now instead of uh, galaxies preferring uh, high concentration halos, they prefer low concentration halos. Um, so all this to show that uh, certain model variations uh, can easily be uh, degenerate with galaxy assembly bias and such Something like that needs to be tested uh, whenever you, you claim detection uh, for galaxy assembly bias. Um, and some people have gone even further and also uh, combined galaxy clustering uh, with galaxy gas lensing. And there's this very intriguing persistent finding that uh, when we take the clustering of galaxies and um, we assume Planck's CMB cosmology and we fit it with a model um, without galaxy assembly bias, then once we fit clustering, we tend to overpredict lensing signal. And so this was very nicely shown in Alexis Delto's work, uh, where she looked at different models for BOSS galaxies. And she showed that all these models uh, tend to overpredict the lensing amplitude. And this is particularly strong uh, on, on these small scales, uh, below, uh, below around one megaparsec, so where we really probe uh, the inner dark matter halo and also halo mass. And again, this looks like a, like kind of like a, a uh, very convincing uh, hint of galaxy assembly bias because we fix, uh, fix, fix the clustering and do not predict direct, uh, correctly predict halo masses. And so both uh, Siran and I led uh, independent studies where we ask, could galaxy assembly bias be responsible for this uh, lensing as low effect? And the conclusion that both of us uh, reached independently was that this mismatch between predicted and observed lensing amplitude is larger than what, you, uh, what is possible with galaxy assembly bias. So here's just a, a plot from Sandy's work where he now includes uh, galaxy assembly bias in the fit and he's still not able to bring the prediction down to the observational level. Um, I wanna mention here that this is done uh, using I think concentration or also spin as secondary property. We haven't tested this yet with local density but there are various reasons why we expect this to persist uh, even if we include this. And so, this shows that there's some other model variation that we're missing here. So for example, you could vary cosmology, but as people have shown, once you do that, you get cosmological parameters are in tension uh, with Planck's and B constraints. Uh, you might also worry about um, variant feedback. And so this not only shows that we should take into account the additional model variations, but we really have to, to explain the data. And so this is what really makes it difficult uh, to detect galaxy assembly bias robustly. Um, but I do wanna say that uh, over the past three years, we have been able to put some limits on galaxy assembly bias, and we have been able to rule out some uh, extreme models. Um, so just one example here would be uh, the H matching model. So H matching is a, um, an extension to the Safed abundance matching framework. Uh, and Safed abundance matching uh, is an empirical model. You just assume that uh, more luminous galaxies live in more massive uh, Dr. Hados or Hados with a stronger gravitational potential well. Uh, characterized by Vmax. 
And so H matching is a, is a very natural extension to, uh, to the subject of abundance matching model, um, whereby you assume that at a given luminosity, uh, there is a correlation between galaxy color and halo age, in the sense that uh, star forming young spiral galaxies uh, live in dark halos that form very recently that are young, and uh, old dead elliptical galaxies live in dark halos that are old that formed uh, very early. And so, whereas uh, sacramental abundance matching is very successful in explaining the luminosity dependent clustering amplitude of galaxies, H matching is then very successful in explaining uh, the color dependent clustering at a given luminosity. As that's what's shown here is just the clustering amplitude for different luminosity samples on the left. And then once we split them by galaxy color, we see that red galaxies uh, cluster much more strongly than blue galaxies. And so this H matching model explains this uh, by assembly bias, basically because red galaxies live in older halos, which even at the same halo mass are cluster more strongly. Um, but this H matching model makes a very a robust prediction that we can test, namely that at a given luminosity or stellar mass, uh, red and blue galaxies live in halos of very similar halo mass. So people have tested that and have found that this is actually not the case. So just two examples here, uh, this is from galaxy gas lensing. What we see is the average dark red halo mass as a function of stellar mass. Uh, and here from uh, satellite kinematics, uh, the mass light ratio as a function of uh, luminosity so here separately for red and blue, and we see there is actually a strong difference in halo masses in the sense that red galaxies live in more massive dark red halos than blue galaxies. And so this shows that this clustering difference is to a large extent related to genuine halo mass difference and not due to uh, halo assembly bias. And so what I just wanted to leave you with is that um, despite our best efforts in the last three years, we have not been able to uh, robustly uh, detect galaxy assembly bias. And while we have been able to rule out extreme models, um, more subtle galaxy assembly bias models like those predicted by analytic models or hydrosims are much harder to robustly um, constrain. Um, so despite this inability to really robustly detect galaxy assembly bias, I think all the three speakers here agree, uh, we're still not too worried when it comes to uh, Galaxy assembly bias as a roadblock to precision cosmology. And so with that, I will hand over to Jeremy. All right, thank you. Uh, I am going to um, finish up by talking about implications for actually trying to constrain cosmological parameters uh, in the presence of assembly bias. Now, if I remember correctly, in 2017, there was actually an argument in the conference about whether or not we should even bother to try to do this. Uh, not so much that you wouldn't actually be able to get some constraints, but, but whether or not you'd actually be able to find anything interesting. So hopefully by the end of uh, this part of the talk, uh, I'll show you that this is a worthwhile thing to do. So I'm gonna start with these three bullet points, which are essentially my takeaways from, from the talk, uh, um, which is first that there is a benefit to uh, looking at nonlinear clustering for cosmology. Um, it does of course require a more complicated bias model as we've talked about you know, um, uh, in the previous two talks but I have to, have to add extra freedom, but the early results do show you get an upgrade in constraints overlooking at large scales. And of course, any robust analysis should incorporate secondary correlations if you're getting cosmology. Part of that is just a purely psychological reason, it's because you want to um, you know, uh, convince the rest of the community that you've done a robust job, but part of it is that not only are there obvious correlations between assembly bias and cosmology, but there may be hidden correlations that you didn't expect before you actually started the analysis. But the early efforts with LRG type samples were pretty positive. Uh, the small effects that we've seen, 10% or so or less, will have a small impact on cosmology. And different ways to incorporate assembly bias actually show consistent results on the mocks. So next slide, please. Um, so here is the constraining power of small scales. Uh, these are three different results from three different papers looking at different quantities you might want to constrain and showing how you get better constraints on those quantities when you include smaller and smaller scale information. So starting on the left, this is the constraints on growth rate of structure from redshift space clustering. Uh, this is from our Amulus project. This is Amulus 3 led by Zhang Dujai. Um, and just showing that as you get to smaller and smaller scales, you actually get a factor of two upgrade over constraints you would get from the same sort of volume by looking at uh, um, uh, linear theory and perturbation theory in the translinear regime. 
In the middle, this is actually looking at constraints on dark energy uh, parameters um, from a three, point, three times two point analysis from a, a hypothetical lensing survey. And pretty much all of the upgrade when you get to smaller scales happens once you get below 10 megaparsecs, once you get past the translinear regime and into the fully nonlinear regime. Now, uh, on the right here, this is now looking at constraints on S8. This is the cluster normalization, the combination of omega matter and sigma 8 um, from um, models that would analyze galaxy clustering, galaxy galaxy lensing. Um, and this will be another annulus paper led by Sean McLaughlin. Now, whereas these first two analyses didn't include assembly bias, the important thing about this McLaughlin paper is that we actually are including assembly bias here. The standard HOD line, of course, does not have assembly bias. That's a standard mass only approach. But the other three lines, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, all have this extra freedom in them to try and model assembly bias. But even with the extra freedom in the model, you're not actually degrading the parameter constraints that you get. So next slide. Uh, so something we certainly didn't have three years ago is that this era of uh, simulation-based analyses of cosmological data is firmly upon us. So I wanted to give a shout out to this paper um, led by Ben Wibking, uh, looking at a um, emulator-based approach using abacus simulations for the galaxy clustering and weak lensing for a boss low Z sample. So on the left, you can see their, their fit to the low Z data of uh, the excess surface density. On the right um, are the cosmological constraints that they actually got from this. So this is actually echoing the things that we've seen with the lensing is low and lensing without borders results, that uh, there is some tension between what we're seeing with these weak lensing results and with uh, the cosmology from Planck, uh, with the constraints from Planck Lambda CDM cosmology. Um, and so hopefully this will be joined by a number of other studies, which are also trying to do uh, complementary things. So next slide. So one thing we are attempting to do right now is upgrade this galaxy clustering emulator I had a couple of slides ago by incorporating assembly bias into it. So our HOD is now going to be this HOD, which depends not only on the mass, but on the large scale density. This adds three new parameters to the HOD model. And then we test this on a bunch of mocks that also include assembly bias. So, um, you know, how you characterize assembly bias is, is kind of user defined, but I think the most useful definition is what is the impact that the assembly bias has on the clustering of galaxy sample relative to the same model without any assembly bias. So that's what's given here on the X axis. So negative is suppressing the clustering and positive is enhancing the clustering. So we have a bunch of mocks and we analyze these mocks with our models. Um, to see if we can constrain cosmological parameters. So on the top is omega matter, then sigma eight, then this gamma F, which is the, the velocity field of the halos. This is like a testing gravity thing. Um, but the purple is if you try to analyze these mocks, assuming there was no assembly bias, right? So in this case, you will actually end up with biased cosmological parameters if the assembly bias is strong enough. Now, if the assembly bias is say less than 10% in the clustering amplitude, actually there's really not much of a difference of whether or not you include or not include assembly bias in your model. So that's the first reason why we feel pretty good about what's going on right now. These error bars are indicative of a boss-like sample. Um, but if you get to more extreme models of assembly bias, if you include the assembly bias in your model, you can always recover uh, the correct cosmological parameters. Okay, next slide. So there was a bit of circular reasoning in that last slide because the mocks that we tested had the exact same assembly bias model put into them, right? That's more of a, you know, a validation test. Uh, there are other analyses out there which are doing very different things. So Johannes is of course going to uh, do a, um, uh, a simulation based approach for uh, richness based distortion analysis on boss like galaxies. Um, he's using the annual simulations, but using a very different approach uh, at many different stages in the whole framework. First is that he's using a decorated HOB, HOD to incorporate assembly bias, uh, different from what we're doing with VMAX as his secondary parameter. And to validate his model, he ran a test on a mock. Now this mock is actually using abundance matching, so it breaks a lot of the assumptions that we use in these sort of simulation-based HOD-based approaches. Uh, and the abundance matching mock that we use uh, actually has assembly bias in it using this Lehman et al. Uh, type of composite quantity to do the abundance matching result on. Um, and this plot is based, which I think was actually shown earlier in the in uh, or in yesterday's talk, so she shows that he can recover the cor the correct value of the growth rate of structure 
um, even if assembly device is actually incorporated into the mock. Now, this is using a mock uh, based on the unit sims. We're using this, he's using this, we, we are sharing this with another group. Um, so if you have an emulator and you would like to actually test it on, on these types of mocks, please um, talk to us. We are happy to share these, these mocks. I think it is good for the community to have a, a common framework or a common set of tools on which to verify or validate all, all of our approaches. Uh, next slide. So then I'll finish up with, um, with talking about this lensing analysis, this Amulus 5 paper coming soon. This is all a theory paper, but it's trying to do a very comprehensive look at all the different ways that you might in incorporate assembly bias. And so some of this has already been introduced by Sian earlier on in, in this session. Um, we have models for clustering and lensing where bias is with a standard HOD, two different types of decorated HODs, and this thing we call correlated or core AB, which is basically kind of like um, conditional abundance matching, but without, you know, without subhalos, right? You're actually um, uh, doing a secondary abundance match on the galaxy occupation number with some secondary, per secondary parameter of the halo. So how this impacts galaxy occupation is shown in this plot on the right. This is at a halo mass where you might expect, you know, one out of every three halos to have a galaxy. So the standard HOD shows about 0.3. But all of these other ways in which you might incorporate um, secondary correlations will shift the galaxies around depending on, on some secondary halo property. So of course, that's how you implement assembly device in your model. There are different choices you can also make, as we've discussed, on what is the proper secondary property to, to use. And there are many choices. And so we actually look at both halo concentration and dark matter uh, density at the 10 megaparsec scale. So we can test both of these. We can test both how you implement it and what secondary property you actually use when you implement it. Um, and the results are in the next slide. So this is actually just one of the results, you know, because there are so many uh, knobs and bells and whistles to play with in these models, there are quite a few different tests with multiple mocks. This is just one that is a reasonable um, example of what we get. So the, the mock data vector is galaxy clustering and galaxy galaxy lensing for a red magic like sample. This is essentially like red galaxies taken from photometric data like DES, slightly higher density than what you would get from a boss like LRG sample. The analysis is using an emulator constructed from the amulet simulations. Uh, for the emulator, assembly bias is constructed using density as the secondary uh, property. And we're testing this on a mock created with the multi-dark simulation, which also includes assembly bias. But in this mock, the assembly bias uses concentration. So we're trying to like uh, mismatch things, not you know, create a situation where the mock is created under a different framework than the actual model. And making sure that we can actually recover the correct pro cosmological parameters. So we have four different um, theoretical models, right? Going from top to bottom. Uh, for each model, we then also set different R min boundaries for the data that we're actually going to include, uh, where the top line would be, we're only going to include scales at five megaparsecs and above. And then we gradually shrink that down, where in the bottom line for each model, uh, we include all scales at 0.1 megaparsecs and above. And so the columns are then constraints on omega matter, S8 and H0, and then these curves are then the parameter constraints with the one sigma regions shaded in. So that you can see that with the standard HOD approach, um, you actually get some pretty significantly biased cosmological parameters. But once you actually go to these three other models where you are incorporating assembly bias in, in a, you know, different ways, um, they all manage to get proper constraints within the one sigma regime. So you can get uh, unbiased cosmological constraints, um, at least for the errors that we have assumed here, uh, independent of the exact approach that you use to implement assembly bias and independent of the exact secondary proper that you use to, uh, to encapsulate the assembly bias. Um, so then to the last slide. So I just want to throw up these first three bullet points that I put at the very um, beginning of my talk. Uh, hopefully I've convinced you that this is a worthwhile thing to do, but there are lots of caveats. Really, this just boils down to future work that we've got lying ahead of us, because this is all the beginning of this sort of work and certainly certainly not the end. Um, everything that we've done at this point is with LRGs. We've now studied these types of samples for about 10 years. We feel pretty good about them, but now things are all gonna trans transition to samples of emission line galaxies. That's gonna be the cosmological workhorse for the next decade. Um, so uh, it is possible that bringing in star formation rate into the target selection algorithm to select your tracers 
maybe opening Pandora's box in terms of assembly bias signals, because we've seen some indication throughout this talk that star formation rates within galaxies on, on the, the star forming sequence may depend on halo formation history. So not only do the type of targets that we're going to be looking at in the future surveys might you know, open up more avenues of, of assembly bias, but the whole reason that we are transitioning to emission line galaxies is that they can probe such larger volumes of the universe with um, such larger samples of galaxies. So we could increase the number of galaxies over BOSS by a factor of 10 or even 100 with some of these upcoming surveys. So whereas BOSS was very impressive, reaching almost percent level precision in clustering measurements at the few megaparsec scale, we're going to reduce those statistical errors by possibly up to an order of magnitude. And so now, once we do that, we need to revisit all these questions with new target points for our models in terms of incorporating all these effects. So in BOSS, um, uh, assembly bias may be a, pretty much a negligible effect, but that's all going to go away when the clustering measurements you have have 0.1% level precision. So uh, all this data is going to start coming in very soon. The path forward is wide open. There's room for a lot of other people to join us, and hopefully there um, is a pot of gold at the end of that rainbow, to mix metaphors. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so now I will open up for uh, questions. Um, I see that there's already a lively uh, discussion going on on the Google Doc, and I'll encourage you to continue to do that. But anyone who wants to have their question discussed, please raise your hand, and I'll try to get to them in the order that they appear. It looks like Neil's question is first. Um, so Neil, why don't you go ahead? OK, yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, so I had uh, two questions, I guess, that I wrote on the doc. Uh, so one of them, I guess, you know, has been uh, discussed. Uh, so like, you know, the first one. Uh, so maybe then I'll start with the, you know, like, you know, you know, you know, you know with my second uh, question, uh, which was for Johannes. Uh, you know, uh, you know. So you mentioned that there's no strong, direct, you know, evidence of assembly bias. Um, so in the doc, you know, so I pointed you to a paper which has a uh, direct five sigma detection. Of assembly bias, you know, also you know, you know, you know, a direct detection, you know, you know, you know, you know, in BOSS DR12 uh, galaxies of, uh, you know, you know, um, of this effect. Uh, uh, so, for, you know, uh, so for cosmology, you know, uh, that detection actually, you know, can be catastrophic. Uh, the reason for this, you know, is that that form of assembly bias happens to be exactly degenerate with redshift space distortions, you know. And so if we marginalize over the unknown assembly bias the same way that we marginalize over the normal galaxy bias, then it kills any sensitivity to the growth rate F coming from RSD measurements. Uh, you know, so in that sense, uh, you know, this fuel assembly bias actually can be, you know, almost catastrophic uh, for, cos you know, you know, you know, you know, for our probes in cosmology. Uh, so that was my, you know, that was my, uh, I guess my second question. The first question, you know, was about this whole idea about using uh, environment as a secondary property to define assembly bias. You know, so to me that sounds just very circular. Uh, so perhaps, you know, Johan can comment verbally what he said, uh, you know, on the doc about that. Wait, who should be answering? Okay. Oh, uh, well, well, let's why, see. why is it circular? <laughs> I, I don't understand why it's circular to use to use density. Okay, so the meaning of clustering is, you know, it's just density, right? You know, the statement that galaxies are clustered together means that those galaxies are preferentially found in high density regions. So if you select objects that that are in high density regions, of course they're more clustered, right? That's the definition of clustering. You know, so you can't use local density, local, you know, local environment to define, uh, you know, to define bias. It's a circular definition. I, I'm st I still don't understand what the problem is. So we're not using density. We're using, you, you can do it any way you want, right? You, um, what we're doing is, is density relative to the mean density for that particular galaxy sample. So it's not that you are picking, it's, it's not that you're, you know, picking out things relative to random cells um, just dropped throughout the survey. Uh, but it's, it's, 
it's, it's changing the halo occupation based upon density, not which then has the effect of, of changing the clustering. Um, I guess I all I'm saying, you know, is that for assembly bias, you know, that term, you know, you know, you know, you know that term means the correlation of some internal property to some galaxy or halo with the large scale uh, clustering. No, it does not necessarily mean an internal property. Well, so if you correlate external properties like large scale density uh, with the large scale clustering, you know, of course they're correlated, right? You know, so yeah, but example, that's what we want. We want to guarantee that there's a correlation there so that it may, maybe that's not the most physical description, but, but the whole reason why you would then use large scale density as opposed to some internal halo property is that I want to have the most flexible model of changing my HOD around so that, so that regardless of what is the reality of assembly bias, I can come up with some model in, in my, in, in my you know, large scale density parameterization of assembly bias that matches that. Yeah, I think, I think the way to think about this is like, it depends on what question you're gonna ask, you wanna ask. If your question is, why is there galaxy assembly bias? Of course you can't say that it's because these galaxies live in dense environments, thus they have higher clustering. But if your question is, how do we generate realistic galaxy mocks given the galaxy you know, density we observe, then it is fair to use the local environment as an indicator of how you're going to put galaxies in halos. I don't, I don't think using environment for assembly bias is a way to understand why there is assembly bias, but I think it is a fair way to build your forward models. I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, okay, I see, I see, okay. Mm -hmm. So the idea just is just to, you know, generate plausible looking mocks as opposed to trying to, yeah. you know, understand or detect this effect in actual data. Yeah, I don't think you can use environment to answer the question of why these galaxies are more clustered, right? Because that, that is circular, but you can use this concept to build realistic HODs. Yeah, it's purely about getting the cosmological parameters out. It is not about getting realistic constraints on assembly bias itself. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thanks. That answers that question. Uh, and so again, you know, you know for Johan, I guess I'd just be curious, you know, to see if you have any comments on the actual detection of assembly bias in actual BOS DR12 galaxies. Um, is that on the detection of anisotropic galaxy assembly bias? Yeah, the... exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's a very good point. Um, I uh, I need to think about this again, uh, and I will come back to you regarding this. Right. You know, but again, for cosmology, this is potentially mm -hmm. catastrophic. Right, right, right. Space it, it was it was based on selecting galaxies uh, based on on the velocity dispersion of of stars, right? So it's nothing that we it might not, not not be something that we actually do in actual observations when we try to constrain cosmology. Yeah, that's right. But it shows that you know you know it shows that the internal properties of galaxies can be correlated with their quadrupole on large scales, right? You know, so yes. in the same way that this dispersion correlates with the large scale quadrupole. You can now imagine many other internal properties of galaxies, like their sizes, for example, you know, projected sizes that we observe in, in 2D on the sky that can also be correlated with the quadrupole, right? Uh, you know, and so therefore, if we have to marginalize over, you know, you know, over parameters like this in the same way that we marginalize over the normal galaxy bias, right? Yeah. Um, Just, yeah. 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 I think in this case, it totally kills any sensitivity, you know, to the growth rate coming from retro space distortions. Yeah, I think in this case also, it's it's not an just an orientation bias in the way that. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's a very similar effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I will think about this and I'll come back to you. Right. Okay. But again, though, it's a five sigma detection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I encourage people to continue that discussion. There's a lot already written in the Google Doc. I encourage people to continue that discussion there too, uh, or other places. Uh, I believe that Yop had his hand up next, so uh, go ahead. Oh, hi, yeah. You know, originally I had the same question as Neil but about the circularity, but I'll ask something else. So um, great talks, by the way. Um, so I'm a bit worried about using um, HOD or, or abundance matching on dark matter only simulations, if you're going to go to these small scales of less than a megaparsec, because then you're getting within the VR radius of halos, and we know the density profiles of halos vary, 
And uh, we've shown that then the subhalos also vary their orbits, they change. So uh, I don't think it's possible to use dark matter only simulations on those small scales. So maybe Jeremy would want to answer that. Uh, yeah, for especially for lensing, this is definitely a big concern. And so um, we're trying to construct mocks uh, as challenge mocks for these types of models that, you know, would have some way of, of kind of uh, bootstrapping dark matter simulations to mimic the effects of, of, of baryons. And then if required, you know, then run, run everything through and see, you know, does the model work or do you actually now have to add even an additional degrees of freedom to the model? To, uh, to encapsulate the effects of baryons. I, I think for redshift based distortions, it's a little bit easier to mock up that effect since you're not you know, directly probing dark matter density profiles. Uh, but you know, you should need, we should, we need, mo basically we just need mocks that, that, that have various levels of realism in them or, or you know, can actually go outside of the range of realism um, in terms of, of orphans and velocity bias and, um, and, and scatter. And basically just touching every base of every possibility about how galaxy formation could be affecting small scale clustering. And if we had real robust models, it wouldn't matter what the bias model was, you'd always recover the correct cosmology. So we're trying to do things like this to incorporate all of these effects into mocks that, that will, that you know, either our, our emulators will pass these tests or we'll have to go back to the drawing board and add extra freedom. So these are, this is on the list of things to do. Yeah, I, I agree with Jeremy. So for lensing, it is really something that we need to take into account. And there are no various theoretical models that we can use to, to do that. And again, for RSDs, it's not that much of an issue. And also because like for a satellite galaxies and centrals, we have very flexible models to include satellite velocity bias, different radio profiles for satellites. So I'm confident that anything that a hydrosim would predict uh, is also encapsulated in such a flexible model. So I think we should be able to marginalize over that. I like your optimism and also the same, the answer to Neil's question that you can use whatever is needed, but I, I then wonder where the cosmology information comes from. Like, for example, in answer to Neil's question, why not just use the clustering itself instead of the local number density, then clearly you would have no information left. Similarly, if you mock up all kinds of biases to compensate for the fact that you're using dark matter only, at some point you would think the information is gone, but apparently it's not. I think, well, there are other statistics out there for us to use, right? So, so I, I envision this is that every time you actually have to add a degree of freedom to the model, you would go out and find a statistic that would actually help you out. I've been a big proponent of void probability function. Um, I, I think lately that's been shown that, that just straight up counts in cells um, is actually better uh, than that for, for constraining um, for constraining these sort of different sort of bias models that, that would break degeneracies with cosmology. So, you know, once we lose constraining power with one statistic, hopefully you can bring in another statistic that would, that would shore things up. I'm sure you can do that, but you'll have a hard time convincing anyone outside your own community. Oh gosh, that, well, <laughs> we, we might be in that situation well, right now. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, that's an interesting open question. Why don't we get to our next question? I believe that was from David Weinberg. So I guess I have you know, further comments on, on the same theme. So, uh, so one, you know, so I agree with what Jeremy said about environmental parameterizations of, of assembly bias that the, um, you know, their, the goal is to, is to describe things uh, and be able to, you know, have something you can marginalize over in, in cosmological fits, um, but it doesn't tell you what the origin is. Um, however, I also would say that, that you can also use it to detect that assembly bias is present or limit the degree to what, to which it's present. Because if you actually show, for instance, that, that you fit things with the, the same HOD in all environments, then that indicates there, there isn't assembly bias that's, that's changing halo occupations as a function of, in a way that correlates with clustering. But the, I think the, the, the thing, the question I had for Neil, um, or at least what's, what's so puzzling me about the, um, 
about the, the boss paper he referenced is, so if we talk about linear regime things, uh, where we take, you know, ratios, uh, say the, the linear theory of ratio space distortions, um, there's a galaxy bias factor that goes in there, but we really don't care what is, um, what has produced that galaxy bias factor. And if it's, you know, caused by things being in high mass halos or caused by preferentially pop populating the halos in dense environments, it's still, you know, there's a BG and you can constrain it and, and remove it if you have the right set of observables. So, um, so I'm wondering what it is about this, this anisotropic uh, assembly bias that is, is undermining that. I mean, it seems like it's, it is something that is changing velocities at, at fixed something else, but, but it, it doesn't seem to be in the category of what we usually talk about as assembly bias, or at least the way I usually think about it. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, so I can answer. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, so assembly bias again, right? Like, like, like you know, this term to me, you know, like, you know this, this term corresponds to some sort of, you know, dependence on internal properties of either halos or galaxies of their large scale clustering, right? And so, okay, right, you know. So we've shown, you know, that the large scale quadrupoles uh, you know, of these boss galaxies depends on their their internal properties in a way that's distinct from how the normal scalar bias BG depends on those same properties, okay? And so the point now is that you have two free bias parameters, mm -hmm. a monopole and a quadrupole bias, right? And so once you have both those parameters to marginalize over, now you've lost any sensitivity you know, to the growth rate F coming from linear redshift space distortions. So basically you have a population that cannot be described by the Kaiser bias uh, redshift space distortion model. If you ignore this sort of quadrupolar bias, that's right. Well, I mean, the, yeah, that's, that's the thing is in the Kaiser model, you don't, you don't get separate uh, bias factors for, for the monopole and quadrupole. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. That's right. You know. But the problem, though, you know, is that in a, so in simulations and also in the real universe, these terms are non-zero. Yeah, I just thought they usually went, they, they usually became small as you got to sufficiently large scales. Right. Uh, well, we've measured this, though, on linear scales. Yeah, no, so that's, I, yeah, that seems, that seems striking and, and, so that result seems much more surprising than the existence of assembly bias in the sense of, you know, galaxy halo occupation depending on on some additional property. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Hey, I have one more hand up. I know we're a bit over time, but I'd like to at least get that question in, so I'll indulge myself as the speaker. Um, Andrew Heron, I think, had his hand up. Uh, do you want to go ahead, Andrew? Sure, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I just actually had a question. Um, basically, I mean, any of the um, speakers could actually address this. Um, I'd be interested to hear their opinions. Um, so I guess, I, so I'm wondering, um, basically what it, what it's going to take in order for there to be a convincing detection of assembly bias. And by detection, uh, I think Johannes has given us two different kinds of detection. One of them he called direct and one of them he called indirect. And to me, one of them is a forwards model and one of them is a backwards model, because in one of them, you make the simulation look more like the data to do the com apples to apples comparison. And one of them, you transform the data to make it look more like the thing that you can predict. And I think direct means the data transformation. So for example, you run some fixed group finder on some fixed mock and you see what you, you use that to validate your, your detection uh, algorithm.
But I think one, one thing that we've pretty convincingly learned since the previous um, Galaxy Halo meeting is that Galaxy Halo uncertainty, even in garden variety HOD parameters, is the dominant source of uncertainty in the problem when trying to detect assembly bias. And so it seems to me that any um, direct method whatsoever will always be holding fixed the dominant source of uncertainty in the problem. And so I'm wondering, one, how we could ever have a, de a convincing detection through such a method. And then like the opposite, the flip side of that question is, um, in a paper led by Andrew Zentner from a couple years ago, we had a Bayesian inference detection in which there was strong preference for non-zero levels of assembly bias based on observational data. I was a little bit disturbed by Yoke's comment that um, Bayesian inference is somehow not believable to people outside of the community. And so I'm wondering if, if there is this skepticism about what one infers from, in principle, like rigorously quantified error bars, how could we ever detect assembly bias through forward modeling methods in a way that would be convincing? Any of the panelists can answer the question either backwards or forwards, whichever whichever direction the question that they prefer to, yeah. to comment on. So I think I know, it's, 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 it's not that, I just to, because you called me out here, it's not that Bayesian inference is not believable. It's just that if you start with a model that's known to be wrong and you co have correction factors for that, that makes it difficult to convince people, right? Exactly. Because, you know. Yeah, I, I, this is Andrew. I, I, since you mentioned me, all my paper also, I exactly agree with Yo. It's not the Bayesian part that's the problem. It's not the inference part that's the problem. I think for that. Yeah, I would just say whatever we method we use ultimately, I think it is important to test these these methods rigorously on like large mock simulations, both from SAMs and HydroSims, so we can really get confidence that we get believable results. It's not an ultimate proof that the methods work, but it is definitely some test that we first need to pass, and we haven't really done that as of now. We want to claim uh, detect detection of galaxy assembly bias. I mean, how do you deal with the fact that there's always a possibility that your HOD or CLF or whatever the heck you use is not sufficiently general, not assembly bias way, but, but you know, even in the standard framework, how do you rule that out as an explanation for any misfit to the data? I think, as Johannes said, you, you need lots of examples that show that it works. No, oh, I'm not sure I understand. I mean, what if it doesn't work? I can't fit. And one explanation is, oh, let's add an assembly bias. And now I do an MCMC and I get a very nice Bayesian evidence that, hey, look, assembly bias, with assembly bias, I can fit it. Without, I can't. But you haven't proven all possibilities without assembly bias. You haven't considered a fully generic HOD without assembly bias. You've made a, a model based on an HOD with an N number of parameters. Maybe you needed N plus two free parameters. Well, well, Frank, I have to disagree with that because what you just said is actually a fundamental limit on the nature of empirical knowledge. Mm -hmm. There is no, there is no, there is no forthcoming test that can ever establish conclusively that any model that fits the data is the model that will fit all data for all time, and so that's actually not an attainable goal. I, I think we're putting the cart before the horse. A little bit, just because we haven't actually fit the data very well. Even in the Zender paper, uh, you know, even with the addition of the assembly bias, the fits are not very good. And I, I first think we should show that we can actually fit the data and, and then see that, okay, we've added all these different things to make the data fit properly. And if I take out this one piece, assembly bias, uh, now I can no longer fit the data regardless of whatever cosmology or, or flexible parameterization of the HOD or whatever I use. That to me is like really ironclad evidence that, that, that that's the explanation. I think, uh, I think the answer is partly what Andrew Heron said because, I mean, this is just what we do in science, right? At some point we say the, any other explanation is just too Baroque for us to be willing to accept it. I mean, that sounds like too wishy-washy of a thing to say, but in actuality, that's what we do. Uh, and I think the issue here is that we just haven't gotten to the point where we have good fits, like Jeremy said, and we haven't gotten to the point where we're confident that most of the other models that work are going to be too broke. I think that's why it persists as a problem. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see any other hands up. 